And so we've got technologists, we've got domain. We think domain is very much going to drive where this goes. And I think we're trying to catch up to the technology, understand it, private permission versus public blockchain, which is going to be um, the most prominent in industry and accounting. How are we going to use that? And only how are we going to deconstruct a blockchain? How are we going to understand the controls? So many different questions that are out there. I think whether it's PwC or EY or any of the others, everyone's working towards proof of concepts and prototypes and trying to figure out how we address those issues because we believe it's real. We might we really believe that this is going to be something. Not sure what it will be. Will it be distributed ledger technology? Will it be with just what form will it take? But something will change um, as these technologies evolve. And if PwC has been in the news quite a bit. Um, how has blockchain technology transformed your organization? Um, is PwC prepared, and what are you guys doing? Yeah, I mean, I just pick up as well on, on the previous question in terms of you know what what problems can this technology solve? We've already demonstrated that the combination of blockchains and smart contracts are incredibly useful to people in finance and operations functions because again, uh, we, we have done uh, build proof of concepts where, for example, the order to cash process, uh, we're able to demonstrate uh, using a blockchain and a smart contract infrastructure um, that we could track from physical assets and the internet of things, so to speak, all the way through to uh, the cash. Um, and of course, lots of people in lots of organizations spend a lot of time trying to do that today, uh, figuring out why did they receive a particular payment or why didn't they receive a particular payment and what was that related to in the real world. So even implementing blockchains alongside uh, their existing ERP systems and their existing infrastructure is, is, is demonstrating value um, from an accounting perspective. So um, it's too early to say that PwC ourselves have been transformed by blockchain. That would be uh, quite a statement. Um, we're definitely in the process of preparing. Uh, I mentioned earlier that, earlier that, of course, we're in dialogue with our clients about uh, how might we use blockchain and associated technologies like smart contracts uh, to help make finance functions more efficient. Um, we're also looking, of course, at how, what it means for our own audit business. Um, there is a disruption effect, obviously. Um, so we're looking again at you know how might we use technology to audit this technology. Um, and again, what would be uh, what would constitute some of the controls that we'd be looking for? Um, I also, obviously, we're also working with accounting standards bodies uh, in terms of again understanding that really crucial question of did anything in my internal system of control move to the blockchain, and if so, uh, what would I need to do to demonstrate that I'm actually uh, still in compliance with the uh, accounting uh, regulations? Um, so those are sort of some of the activities that we have ongoing. Maybe to add one thing, when we think about core audit in the past, it's very much a financial statement, financial reporting audit. Um, so the standards that are set, the assertions that are set, that's been the product, that's been the core service. We do have a view that blockchain can change that. I mean, if you've got activity, frictionless activity going between two counterparties, is there an opportunity to step in between that? How will a trusted brand of an auditor or an accountant? But there's so many regulatory questions, so many standard questions, so many domain focused issues that have to be answered. And again, it's it's very much a suits and jeans, trying to understand, and at EY, we, I didn't call the firm, but EY, we certainly have a laundry list of questions that we're looking to answer, just like PwC. We're in the market, working with our clients, trying to understand the auditability of blockchains, trying to understand what are the criteria, how would you determine what a valid blockchain is. So a lot of things that are popping into our industry could be disruptive, if, if nothing else, it's, it's innovative. You know, how do you think the accounting industry will balance transparency with privacy? And I know I'd like to open up that kind of conversation question that the all day panelists do. Yes, so I don't know much about the accounting industry. Uh, I can say uh, so for this decentralized system like Bitcoin, Ethereum, there is potential for users if they want not to be accountable <coughs> for purpose, then there is more potential there compared to the traditional banking system. So like you, you could say that something like Bitcoin resembles more uh, cash basically. And, uh, credit card transactions. So uh, there is this uh, analogy that uh, so Bitcoin would be something like uh, like all your credit card statements become available to the public, but the name of everything that you are buying is reducted. So uh, there is some it's, 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 there are some comparisons to cash, and if somebody wants to be anonymous and uh, and you might be accountable than you can. Uh, of course, you can design another system that uh, uh, people have to be accountable in the system, but right now, 
in the wild, in the, re in the real world, uh, there is no such a decentralized system where everybody has to be accountable. That is popular and running. Uh, so uh, in the future, uh, if people continue with something like this, this also applies to Ethereum and other decentralized systems. So in the future, if people will want to, to use this kind of system, then of course, if everybody is honest, then the, the, you can improve the accountability aspects, but there is also potential to, to people use it as they use cash and they try not to be accountable. Joseph, yeah, right. uh, sure. So um, I consider privacy uh, very important. Uh, there are many kinds of transactions that uh, people and companies engage in that uh, should be completely private. Um, that said, right from the start of Ethereum and from the start of consensus, uh, we believe that uh, a rich sense of blockchain identity uh, would um, permeate 99.99% of transactions, percent of uh, interactions. And so um, on the public blockchain on Ethereum, um, we have built an identity system called Uport. Uh, it's a self-sovereign identity system. It's a system that uh, uh, anybody in the world, uh, any organization in the world, any device in the world potentially uh, can create their own self-sovereign identity on public blockchain and um, upload attributes encrypted, um, have attestations uh, made by uh, legacy identity providers so that you're linking your blockchain-based identity into the legacy infrastructure. Um, the data that you upload, it can be financial data, health data, or whatever, it's encrypted, it's selectively disclosable uh, in situations that, that you choose. Uh, so I think that uh, marries the best of both worlds. Scott, Grady, um, how do you think the accounting industry will balance transparency and privacy? Yeah, I mean, I think um, look, we have teams at PwC that are today engaged in anti-fraud and looking for, um, you know, demonstrating how people are complying with laws around, you know, anti-money laundering and know your customer and so on and so forth. Um, so I think we're very interested in our forensics practice, our fraud practice, in understanding, uh, you know, do public blockchains circumvent any of these laws? Uh, or do they provide opportunities for where that could happen in, in, the dark, in the dark economy? We've written about this. Um, so that's important to us, right? Um, I think, um, you know, from a transparency perspective, obviously that's one of the fundamental principles of, of auditing and assurance, right, is to, is to demonstrate that, that transparency, but there's, you know, um, there are limitations to disclosures that go beyond sort of, um, you know, what the rules uh, make you disclose. Um, and so I think that would, uh, you know, be down to sort of uh, the preparers in terms of how much disclosure uh, that, that they're giving over and beyond what they're legally uh, required to do. But, um, you know, I think, again, we're interested in, in understanding how this ecosystem evolves um, and how, again, transparency not only for the preparers but for the regulators and the auditors uh, could be made more efficient by effectively having them participate into the system. Scott? Yeah, I'd say maybe there's three dimensions. There's identity, there's transparency, and there's privacy. So I think the first two, transparency and identity, are a must. I, I do not see how the industry moves forward without being able to identify counterparties and add transparency into this transaction. The privacy, in today's world, there are private and public transactions. So I wouldn't see that changing either. There's, you know, there's competitive transactions. There's, there's all kinds of activity that would be considered private versus public. So I really think it comes down to identity, and it comes down to transparency. Great. Thanks, Scott. Uh, final question, and we'll open it up to the audience for more questions. Um, what are the most promising and recent developments in the blockchain space? Um, you know? Okay. So, uh, <laughs> research about uh, scalability of a system like Bitcoin using uh, either uh, some good system for off-chain channel where you know, uh, parties who only want to interact among themselves don't need to tell the rest of the network about uh, what they are doing. They can do many fast transactions and then just commit them to the blockchain later. Uh, or there's other ways to change the, like the the structure of the Bitcoin blockchain to something else that supports, uh, supports more scalability. This is one kind of research. Uh, there is research about how to do 
uh, making blockchain with privacy in the best kind of way. And, and, and so usually that kind of stuff is not exactly what you guys were talking about. This is about like total privacy. But if you want, like what I said in the beginning, like the idea where like users can be private, but there is some entity that is supposed to know some countable information. So in theory, those kind of things are possible, but uh, uh, like the ideal version of them is very difficult to pull off. Um, there, is, uh, there is about some applications of uh, smart contracts and that kind of research, uh, things that you can do there. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, just what's one of the most promising recent developments in the space? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, can, I, can I tell you about two? Because I'm super excited about two things that are happening. One happened this weekend <laughs> at the United Nations. We were there for ID2020. Um, and that's an initiative sponsored by the UN uh, to give identity to all people in the world who don't currently have it, uh, using a digital identity and, and probably a blockchain sort of system. Um, and it's just super exciting, right? So we're opening up. Uh, the possibility to track people uh, who are not tracked today in terms of you know their refugee status. Uh, we're also opening up the possibility of, of, of providing other services to these people uh, in terms of financial services, health services, and so on. So that is just amazing uh, work that, that's going on. The second thing I would say, uh, the use case that I see most prevalent, uh, prevalent in our clients right now that's getting most attention uh, is around supply chain and uh, tracking and tracing, um, whether it's you know a car manufacturer or whether it's a Consumer goods, uh, you know, it's just, it's uh, every single client we sit down with, uh, we can absolutely find a use case around supply chain that delivers value to the consumer and also to the manufacturer uh, every time we write those use cases. So I'm super excited about, about supply chain. Thank you. Joe? Yeah, there, there are probably a hundred exciting projects out there that I can mention. Um, so I won't enumerate those. I'll, I'll keep it higher level. Um, it, it's all about decentralization. Uh, we are moving from a world in which uh, we have top-down command and control structures and companies uh, to a world where we have um, distributed decentralized peer-to-peer -peer networks. We're moving from uh, a web 2.0 sort of situation where we have um, big gateways, big entities that uh, control your identity and, and your communications and monetize those things to a situation where we have um, open platforms and inside markets. So uh, in in the Web 3.0 world, the world that's coming, uh, you uh, using your identity, your perhaps U-port identity, uh, will maintain the elements of your identity uh, encrypted and selectively disposable on your side of the browser. Uh, and um, you will interact peer-to-peer uh, -peer in this decentralized world. So instead of uh, a uh, centralized siloed entity uh, like Facebook being in the middle of all your transactions and monetizing all those things, you'll be able to set up peer-to-peer uh, -peer relationships. So one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-many, uh, and uh, carry out your business with a mark in the middle. Um, so if you do choose to uh, monetize your identity, your attention, your communications, that's up to you. Uh, and uh, you will receive any sort of compensation for that. Scott? Yeah, I would agree with Greg. I think for us, the most exciting is we're moving out of FinTech, out of financial services, into supply chain. We've got a campaign we call it Ops Chain. Um, because we do feel that that's where there's real opportunity for frictionless transactions, for disintermediation, really simplifying that process, getting to inefficiencies, all the things that technology and blockchain problems. So we're in 100% agreement. Um, supply chain is just a huge area of exposure right now with the, uh, with the DLT and the blockchain technology. Thank you, everybody. I think we have time for maybe one or two quick audience questions. Uh, do we have a hand? Um, please. Uh, I have a question about the impact of technology on the CPA profession. I represent a regulator which for NASBA, which work for State Board of Accountancy for grant CPA licenses. There's a growing concern that technology could make CPA profession less relevant. And my question to both accountant firm as well as the tech representative is, what do you think regulators and a profession who is not currently involved in blockchain or data analytics because not everyone is, should be doing a 
which would be the best to prepare for regulators like PCOB, FARB, as well as state board, is what could we do to help the potential to survive? Sure, sure. Uh, we are very focused, and again, back to suits and jeans. It's, it's a domain driven technology enabled. Uh, CPA is going to continue to be the most important component of accounting and auditing. Technology is going to enable us to do different things, but it's, it's really hard for me to believe that five years from now or ten years from now, there won't be but more things for CPAs and accounts to be doing, not less, because the world will be changing. And I understand the transition period, I understand this disruptive, innovative area, but I think if you look far enough into the future, domain tends to win out in these types of uh, equations. Technology enables different folks to enter into the market, but I, I really feel strongly that the CPA and the account will survive um, and prosper. Well, uh, we at Consensus speak to a huge number of central banks, monetary authorities, regulatory bodies around the world. Uh, and there's great excitement um, in this technology. The ability to monitor transactions in real time, understand real time flows is, is uh, really powerful. Um, the, um, uh, moving, drop my point. Um, as we move, and it's gonna take a long time, but as we move, uh, into building systems that have regulation uh, built into them. Uh, basically, you uh, have technologists installed in, in the regulators' offices. Uh, regulators themselves get uh, very tech savvy, and regulators start to write uh, the rules in the form of software specifications, perhaps. Uh, you're going to have uh, systems that are um, very difficult to game uh, intentionally. And so uh, if you move into this world where regulators are, say, writing uh, software test suites uh, and uh, have bankers and other kinds of institutions validate their software against this test suite, it should be, uh, it's going to take time to get it all right, but it should be uh, possible to build systems that are closer to being flawless. Uh, taking it one level down the road, um, uh, regulation is often in place to protect the consumer from third parties who are custodying their assets. Um, blockchain, uh, these systems, these uh, multi-sig wallets uh, enable us to securely uh, custody assets and we're tokenizing virtually everything or will be tokenizing virtually everything. Um, so what does a world of regulation look like when there aren't any third parties that uh, need to be custodying assets? I think that's all the time we have today for this panel. Um, can you please everybody give them a round?